In this lesson, we'll be covering the approach for one of the more complex and often difficult tasks you'll encounter with reading comprehension passages in the verbal reasoning section, and that's going to be inference tasks. So first, let's just kind of talk about how many of these you'll likely see per passage. Now, they are going to be often considered more difficult reading comprehension tasks. You're going to generally see one to two inference questions per passage in the verbal reasoning section, but it is a possible task for both specific and broad subjects. They can ask you inferences about the passage overall or about specific details and concepts within the passage. Now, strategically, you have to hold yourself to a really tight single targeted reread of the passage for any inference question, because otherwise you may just spend way too much time searching for information. You can only predict here by broadly summarizing the, re the relevant subject matter or the passage overall, because you're not going to be able to generally predict specifically what the logical inference is, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. You have to be aware of also wasting time by closely cross-checking each answer choice. The answer choices are not going to be in the passage necessarily for an inference correct answer, and that's a challenge too. It's something that is like a half step beyond what the passage literally states. So just looking for terms or information that is in the passage can be incorrect, and you can actually end up wasting time while also getting the question wrong. And ultimately, what inference questions ask is quite simply what must be based on the information provided that isn't literally stated. So let's talk about how inferences work and how you can identify logical inferences almost from kind of a flip side of the coin logic. So GMAT inferences should require no additional information. They are true based solely on the information presented. You don't need any outside knowledge. GMAT inferences are also not literally redundant, so you're not going to see Bill was at the store, and then the correct answer is Bill was at the store. But you could see something like Bill was at the store, so you can infer that Bill was not at his house, because Bill is at the store and the store is not his house. You can also train yourself to avoid positing or predicting reasonably possible outcomes that aren't necessarily certain. And Whatever your GMAT inference is must have no exceptions based on your literal interpretation of the information in the passage. So let's just consider a, a scenario to kind of illustrate how this would work. So if Dwayne's bullfrog died last Wednesday, there are many invalid but reasonable inferences you can make, such as Dwayne is sad about his bullfrog dying, but we don't know that for certain. It just is something that's possible but not definitive. Similarly, Dwayne no longer has a bullfrog is reasonable, but not definitive because theoretically Dwayne could have a bullfrog farm and because it's his business, some number of bullfrogs die on a regular basis. So Dwayne doesn't get sad about the bullfrog dying and still has many bullfrogs is a possible outcome. But there are some things that we know for certain. So our valid and definitive inferences here. First, that bullfrog, the one we referenced, is dead this Thursday. Because if that bullfrog died last Wednesday, it stays dead. There are no zombie bullfrogs, so we can say definitively that this specific bullfrog belonging to Dwayne is dead this Thursday if Dwayne's bullfrog died last Wednesday is accepted as a true statement. And similarly, we know that Dwayne's bullfrog, this specific bullfrog, has to have been alive last Wednesday for it to have died last Wednesday. We don't know that the bullfrog was alive on Tuesday, even though that seems like another reasonable inference. But we do know that even infinitesimally, that the bullfrog must have been alive on Wednesday prior to having died on Wednesday. Could have, I think bullfrogs would hatch, I think amphibians are eggs. So bullfrog theoretically could have been born on Tuesday, then, or sorry, been born on Wednesday, then died on Wednesday in tragic circumstances. So we don't know about Tuesday, but we know about Wednesday. And this is how inferences are going to work on the GMAT. It's things that without any additional information based solely on definitions of terms 
are 100% certain without any outside knowledge. So now that we've seen how inferences work hypothetically, let's consider one as a question with a passage that you might recognize from one of our other lessons. So <clears throat> first, we're always going to set up our scratch work writing out our question as a standard question. So we see the clumsy GMAT style language. It can be inferred that the author of the passage believes that public health programs targeting obesity are. So we see the word inferred. So that makes us think what must be as a structure. And we can just simplify this as what must the author of the passage believe about health programs targeting obesity. Now, if you've seen this passage before, you'll recognize that we have done a passage map. And if you had that passage map, if this was the third or fourth question of the passage on the exam, you could use that as reference. But if this were the first question, which it could be of a passage, we would just scan for the relevant subject term, in this case, obesity. And we see obesity in the second paragraph. So We'll read the second paragraph, just to get enough context here. So far, economists have not reached a consensus on whether obesity raises economic efficiency problems. If obesity results from informed individuals willingly making diet and lifestyle choices, there's no way to argue for inefficiency. It must be concluded that many are willing to accept extra weight because the, high co the cost of diet and exercise is too high. On the other hand, Arguments for intervention could be mounted on the basis of imperfect information about the relationship between diet and health. Nevertheless, many in the public health community have proposed interventions, and taxing snack foods has been advocated frequently, but without a clear statement of the efficiency problem caused by being overweight and obesity. We cannot say whether such taxes might increase or decrease economic efficiency, i.e. whether benefits exceed costs. So the author basically is kind of agreeing with the economists that there is a, a consensus on whether obesity raises economic efficiency problems. The author actually equivocates, kind of says both sides could be true. So now that we've got that as a prediction, we go to our answer choices. Just in our brain, we're like, okay, you know what? Obesity, we don't know whether or not it's something that should be acted upon. So choice A Destined to fail because they cannot achieve economic efficiency, that destined to fail is way too extreme, so we can eliminate choice A. Now, choice B could be operationalized through economic incentives. This is the bland language that we know the GMAT likes as correct answers. And if we're at the end of the, pa uh, the, the paragraph and passage by that extent, we could see that many in the public health community have proposed interventions and taxing snack foods has been advocated frequently, and we don't know if they're going to work. So the taxes would be an economic incentive. It probably isn't how you'd think of it, but that is something that is 100% definitive that it's been advocated. It's something that's out there. So it's possible that the health problems or health programs targeting obesity could be executed or operationalized with these economic incentives of the tax taxing of snack foods. So this actually matches everything in the passage. And if you recognize it, go ahead and make that a check. But going through the rest of the answer choices briskly, now that we've got something that matches our broad understanding and the subject matter 100% as something that must be, we see choice C, not justifiable based on concerns to the public health. Again, the author is not coming down on either side, it says it's uncertain. So not justifiable can be eliminated as being too extreme. Choice D would be most effective if they focused on personal responsibility. Again, the author does not take a stand this strong, so choice D is out. And unwarranted attacks on the public desire to consume junk food. There's a whole bunch of reasons we could eliminate this one. We'll just say that the author has not really come down with any sort of opinion about the, the public's desire to consume junk food. So we know that choice B is the correct answer here. And again, it's something based on the information literally in the passage that is unstated and must be true, which is going to be the correct answer for any inference task, something that is guaranteed to be true, but wasn't explicitly outlined in the literal language. So for future inference task questions, step one, of course, is going to be to note key terms indicating an inference task, such as imply, infer, or suggest. If you see any of these three terms, they're basically saying what must be, and then you rephrase the question itself in the form of that what must be while setting up your scratch pad as always. 
Then step two, use the specific term or location reference to target your reading and always read at least one sentence above and below to guarantee context, unless it's talking about the passage overall, in which case you'll just rely on your passage map. Then step three, predict what the answer should do only by summarizing what the passage said about the subject in the question. Don't get down into like trying to predict too specifically. Again, you're not going to say, Bill walked in the room and he's wet, so therefore I infer that he must not be dry. That's just not how it works, but that's literally how the inference test on this exam will work. It has to be the thing that is definitively true, but you just summarize the circumstance so that when you find something that's in the answer choices that's 100% certain, you're like, that's correct because of what I know of the circumstance from the passage without going too far saying that because Bill's wet, it must be raining or he must have gone swimming because you don't even know if Bill is wet with water and not Mountain Dew. So then step four, of course, process of eliminate for uh, four of the choices, focusing on incorrect actions and descriptions that are definitively wrong. In the case of inference tasks, that's largely going to manifest itself in the form of reversals, things that are the opposite of the passage, things that are extreme that go too far based on the passage, and things that are only possible, not certain based on the information in the passage. And those are the ones that are most challenging to ignore because they're things that seem reasonable but aren't definitively true. And we know that our right answers have to be 100% certain based on the passage without exception. And when you're down to two, focus on actions and descriptions for definitive reasons to eliminate. And in this case, that's largely quantifiers and qualifiers that go too far rather than just looking for basically memory traps, familiar terms that you want to select because you're like, hey, I remember that. That's often how the exam creates attractive but incorrect choices and makes you want to select them is by using terms that you recognize from your uh, recent reading. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and see how we will execute our process for inference tasks using our scratch board when you encounter them on the verbal reasoning section and to that extent in the data insights section as well when you're going through and finding what must be to properly answer for a correct inference. So as always, we set the scratch work first. We got A, B, C, D, E. We put a little line over top and we want to note what our task is to start. And we see the author of the passage would probably agree with which of the following statements about the solicitation process used to grant time for scientists to use the Hubble Space Telescope. So what must the author believe of, we'll just call it the HST time soliciting What's an I there? Actually, that's just an unfortunate statement. <laughs> the letter I, not an actual I. HST time soliciting process here. So we write that out and we know that's what we're focused on. So we just want to look for that information. And if you recognize this passage from one of our prior lessons, you'll know what the overall passage map was. But if you don't, and if or if this were the first question of this passage, I might just look for the solicitation process to grant time to use the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, the way that the exam can get difficult is this may actually be in multiple places in the passage, but we see that we talk about the Hubble being a public use or a public facility open for use by any astronomer from around the world. Each year, an announcement goes out to the worldwide community soliciting research proposals for use of Hubble and its instrumentation. Then we talk about the instrumentation for a while, and that's not really going to be all that relevant. But then we find in the second paragraph, the mechanism by which this, meaning the major advances in the prior sentence, is achieved is the open proposal solicitation, peer review, and selection process that brings into the Hubble Research Program observers from the entire international community. And we know there's a lot of demand for the time, and we know it doesn't get to uh, it, that not all researchers get to use the Hubble. So we, the author knows that the HST time soliciting process, well, it's open to all and not all 
get to be approved. And it's important to the HST success. So I just summarized everything about that process so we could cross check. Now, choice A seems okay, but it goes too far because guarantees the success is extreme. That's not something that must be, so we can eliminate choice A. Now, it being a waste of time for most scientists, even though many extremely research proposals are rejected each cycle down here in the second paragraph, that doesn't mean that it's a waste of time. I mean, they might have gotten the time in another cycle, so we get rid of B as being extreme as well. Now, cannot be reasonably improved. Again, it seems like a good process, but it cannot be reasonably improved is probably as well a bit extreme. It is definitely the most critical factor in the telescope's success, and that too is going to be a little bit too extreme because even though it says possibly the most critical factor, it doesn't mean definitely. And this is where, again, if you recognize that phrase, the most critical factor from the very first sentence, you might fall for the memory trap, but that too is extreme. Now, it is responsible for a breadth of scientific achievement, nice and bland. This is good and bland because responsible for a breadth of scientific achievement, that just means a lot of scientific achievement. And we know that it's a possibly most critical factor from the first sentence. We know that it goes into the entire astronomical community. And we've got a whole bunch of different research uh, pro, uh, proposals and projects that go into this. So choice E is going to be our correct answer and something that the author must believe based on the information in the passage and nothing else. So if we scroll on down, we'll take a look at one more example. And once again, we set up our scratch work. We got A, B, C, D, E. And this time we see one of our key terms, inferred, so we know that this is an inference to ask pretty directly. So which of the following can be inferred from the passage concerning the Hubble Space Telescope's instrumentation? So what must be of the HST instrumentation? And again, I probably would advocate for writing this out. It takes 10 seconds, if that, on your scratch pad. And I know that I'm now going to be in this first paragraph. And so we see the word instrumentation show up for the first time here. So I probably go a sentence above and we'll just read the excerpt. Each year, an announcement goes out to the worldwide community soliciting research proposals for use of Hubble and its instrumentation. That instrumentation is a complementary set of camera spectrographs and other more specialized devices, such as stellar coronagraphs and interferometers. It is extremely versatile and covers a wide range of performance characteristics taken as sensitivity, such as sensitivity, resolution, and wavelength coverage. Taken together, the Hubble instruments provide essentially a complete toolbox for astronomers to utilize in attacking almost any problem in modern optical astronomy. So, choice A, it is used mostly as a visualization tool. So, here's the thing. You have to make sure that you're reading carefully because we know we're talking about cameras, spectrographs, and you might be like all of these different devices, but we're talking about modern optical astronomy. And optical is going to match visualization pretty well. So I'm going to hold on to this with my squiggle. It could become a check. Now, choice B, we've got some terms, coronagraphs, spectrographs, interferometers, but we don't ever actually compare them against each other in terms of use. So choice B is going to be a bad comparison. But they're hoping you recognize those terms and try to select it. Then choice C, individual devices are often taken offline for routine maintenance. We don't actually discuss maintenance at all, so that's going to need outside knowledge. So then choice D, its cost was covered by an international astronomical consortium. Uh, that's not in there at all, so that would require outside information as well. 
it was developed primarily to allow for greater wavelength coverage. Well, we know it's extremely versatile and it covers a wide range of characteristics, including wavelength coverage, but we don't know that it was developed primarily for that. So that too would be a bad comparison or we can categorize it as having been extreme. And of course, our correct answer here is A, because we recognize the similarity and thereby the proper inference that can be drawn from optical to visualization. So remember that you're looking for what must be as you practice your own inference questions in reading comprehension passages to improve at what is probably one of the higher end difficulty tasks you'll find in reading comprehension passages, both in the verbal reasoning section and potentially certain data insight style questions.